I hope the password can, didn't confuse anyone, but they should be used to Zoom calls by now. So you said we had 158 signed up? Yep, 150, some give or take. Give it another minute or two and then we'll start. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terry Martell. I'm director of the Weissman Center for International Business. And I want to welcome you to our first virtual Mitsui Forum. Uh, Mitsui and Company USA has been funding this series for 20 years, and this is about the 155th presentation that we've had. But Times change, the environment changes, and now we find ourselves virtual. Uh, there are some rules to, uh, to follow with respect to uh, virtual. Uh, if you've got a question, please type the question into the uh, chat box. Uh, please mute your microphones, and uh, this session is being recorded. I intend to share this presentation with my uh, my friends at the Southwestern University of Economics, of Finance and Economics in Chengdu, China. Uh, so this is truly a multicultural uh, experience here. We're looking at some original research here, and I'd like you to uh, focus on that. So you'll be hearing this uh, first, and able to understand and see what is happening here. There, there's a serious academic uh, uh, expectation with respect to this series of, of forums that we've been running. Uh, for myself, there's, there's uh, a couple of goals. Um, there used to be, you get a nice lunch. Unfortunately, that has gone by the board. However, the intellectual substance remains. So you come away from this presentation knowing something you didn't know, always a good thing. You come away from this performance seeing a senior level executive, in this case, a chief executive officer, speak to you. And in so speaking, you get a chance to learn how senior management presents to an audience, right? Something that you should internalize yourselves. So there's a lesson here about content and there's a lesson here about presentation skills, both of which you need if you intend to be successful in this very competitive world in which we live. Um, I want to thank Khalif Langton, who is the chief partnership officer for Brodeur, and also a member of my advisory council for arranging this uh, presentation. Uh, it's, it's another example of how business executives in, in the New York area work with Baruch 
to try to leverage the skills of our students and reinforce those skills. Today, we're pleased to have with us Andrea Covelli. Covelli. <laughs> what? Covelli. Sorry. Yep. You know, no worries. Uh, that's, that's the thing I do least well, as Ruthie will attest, <laughs> right? I can mess up my wife's name. I, <laughs> it, is, it is a big plus in your career. Uh, that's, that's why I stayed as a professor. Uh, anyway, Andy is CEO of Broadway Partners, okay? and which is a, uh, <clears throat> specializes in helping organizations achieve relevance. What is relevance? an elevated brand state that fully engages the market's emotions, senses, and community-minded impulses. Okay. Andy has built Brodua from, into a diversified uh, firm that handles many, many uh, different aspects of communication skills. She has a uh, degree in English and communication from the University of New Hampshire, He's published a book, Relevance, The Power to Change Minds and Behavior, published in 2014. She just completed another book on relevance, which is coming out here in November. Uh, she has spoken at Harvard, Yale, Wharton, and Baruch, having joined us yeah. a couple of years ago to give us a, a presentation. So uh, Andy is a CEO who understands the importance of ensuring that the next generation of leaders gets a uh, leg up in terms mm -hmm. of understanding what's going on in the world. So Andy, thank you very much and please take over. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, I'm really honored to be the first person also that's on, in your virtual series. That's really cool. So you can, all the mistakes that I make, <laughs> you'll learn from them and you can use them the next time around. But thank you so much for your generous introduction. I'm really, um, I wish I could see you all. I can see just a few people, but um, I'm really, I really, it's a true pleasure to meet you. I'm actually um, giving this presentation from my home. So please excuse me if you hear any animal noises or shadows passing in the back of my screen or anything like that. I'm sure you all are in the same situation. Um, it is, it's, I'm so excited to, to actually have the opportunity to share this research with you because as Terry said, no one's seen this um, yet. This is research um, that we would, um, would it be Ru Ruthie okay if I had control so I could advance the slides? Thank you so much. I think, yeah, it's not, it's not working. I'm not able to scroll down or up. But if worse comes to worse, yeah, I'm stuck. Andy, you might use arrows. I am using the arrows. I'm so, it's just not, it's not, it's not allowing me the control. It says you're screen sharing, but I can't move up or down. There you go. I can do that, but it won't let me do it with my, I'll try my hardest, you guys. I'm using my mouse to do it. So, this is the latest wave of Broder um, relevance research, which we um, which we just completed, and um, and the focus. And I'm just getting my bearings a little bit because it's hard for me to try to figure out how to make this work. Anyway, I'll I'll, I'll start again. Um, what is so exciting about this research to us is it's it's a look um, back and a comparative study from our original research, which we did uh, in 2011. And you know, at that time, we were really looking at, uh, we, were, we were beginning the foundation for our relevance research. And we were trying to figure out if there was a way to really link communications to behavioral change. And our hypothesis was that could you, there's a lot of things you know about the way people interact with information, but is, is it possible to kind of find those hidden gems, those things that people actually don't know a lot about, and they're actually, can be very, very significant in terms of getting people to change their behavior. So that's where, where we set out from. And we started looking at things like 
um, consumer packaged goods. We looked at sports. We looked at higher ed. We looked at charitable, charitable foundations. We looked at financial services companies. So this was very, very broad. We also looked at across all age groups. We looked at gender. We looked at region. We looked at ethnicity. We, we, we really carved the data up in a myriad of ways. So the point was, it was a great place to start, but we wanted to benchmark this at this particular moment in time to see if there were any significant changes over the last years, 11, last nine years. And also in the, in the last um, six months in particular, how were people coping with the challenges that have been paused, you know, have been posed by the, the pandemic? A lot of the, um, the social unrest, which is, you know, which has, uh, which has been just um, dominant in in our minds and thoughts, and then really related to that, to both of those things, is the current election in the United States. And I know many of you might be looking at it this outside the country, but you're certainly seeing, you know, through your news sources what we're going through. And um, so we wanted to look at those things. Now, this study, again, the, you're the first ones to see it, but it took place in May. The, the exception to this is that we just did, there's an additional segment that we just did last week, and it was very specific to Gen Z. And we were looking at things like, in this moment in time, what will it take for brands to resonate with Gen Z? How are they using social media as a source for consuming and sharing news? And what do we think the future is of social media for Gen Z? So in addition to those elements that I just spoke of, we added this panel in last week. So you're seeing a combination of both. And as you know, all of you who have studied research at school, that when you're doing a, a survey, you, you try to make your sample st you know, statistically correct. So it has, to, it has to match the census of the US. So that's, it did do that. It was ensured to do that. So um, I'm admitting more people. One of the problems with this, and I'm so sorry, is I, I, I can't, I'm unable to, um, ooh, I can't, I can't, my builds won't work. So I'm gonna just put them all up at once. I'm so sorry, you guys, that we're having this little glitch. So, you know, if we're looking right now at this moment in time, how is COVID-19 affecting Americans' priorities and perceptions? You know, in there, and, and it is, and it, it, it is big time. What is the impact of these, the, the, you know, the challenges of civil discourse? And in particular, I think you all can guess the, the you know, the, the root of a lot of this is the exchanges on social media. And, and, there, are, and there are actually, you know, generations that are much more active on social media, not necessarily the younger ones, uh, you're going to see the data around this. It's surprising the people that are, are actually contributing to a lot of the civil discourse on social media. I mentioned to you a little a minute ago about the shifts in brands and social. And, you know, it might be interesting for you guys to know, even though, you know, some of the reasons for looking at a school have not changed, there, there have been significant changes for students in choosing their college or university. Um, so, Moving forward, I thought it might help everybody just sort of very quickly understand what I mean by relevance. When we first studied relevance, our idea was that there's a human being at the center of information. And for those of us in communications, we can kind of break it down into four areas. We look at all of the things that are data driven that we assess when we're thinking about something. So if we're buying a car, we're looking at mileage, we're looking at reliability, we're looking at the, you know, the, the climate we're driving in. That's all of the kind of the data points we think about in, in interpreting something about a brand we're engaging with. The values are the values you personally as a human being bring to whatever brand you're engaging with. And I'd love to use the example of the American Cancer Society because everybody, probably in some way has known someone that has been impacted by cancer and certainly wants it to be eradicated from, from the earth. And I think if we look at what the American Cancer Society is trying to do, people that have those similar values are gonna really engage with the brand through their heart, through their, through their values. The community, those are the online and offline communities you personally bring to a brand experience or an idea or an organization or a college or university. So 
imagine it's Patagonia and you love to camp or you love, a, you know, you, you love their parkas. Um, you're bringing your community of, of people with you that enjoy that type of brand experience and you're connecting it with Patagonia. And what you're, what's happening is we found that just being associated with that community of people makes you feel better about yourself. And you, and you kind of want to say, I'm, I, I'm, I'm part of this community. It makes you proud to be part of it. That's kind of the, the um, initial essence of what a tribe is. And we're going to talk a little bit more like that, but there are tribes that are built around experiences. And then finally, it's the sensory experience. And I always use my, my phone as a great example of the very first time you touched on a screen or you were able to, you know, play a video or, you know, pat your dog or anything that just makes you feel happy or excited. Um, that's a sensory experience. And brands do that. They create those experiences and allow you to connect to them. So thank you, um, Terry. I'll skip over this. Um, but this was the first book and my um, co-author and I are looking at this this kind of what's happened next because nine years ago when we started relevance it was a time of an incredible noise there was so much brand diversity there um you could you could you could choose any kind of virtual experience that you wanted you could choose any kind of real-time experience you wanted you could walk into any store pop up you could choose any experience on video time was shorter we didn't have much time and you could access content really any anytime anywhere what's happened now with with the pandemic is that and with the election and with um you know black lives matter movement and all of the racial injustice that's going on is add to that loss add to that stress add to that anxiety add, add to that in an incredible level of emotion and stress that is overlaid with just the just the amount of choice. So that is a really important thing for brands to understand about what we are going through. Now again, this is an American study. And I'm sure a lot of you, you know, were born, you know, like I, you know, born in this country, but there's probably a lot of people that are students um, that are from other parts of the world, like at any other university. And if you if you ask people, you know, in this survey sample, how they describe the American spirit, how they would describe it maybe a year ago, they would say things like entrepreneurship, tenacity, ingenuity, and curiosity. What was really interesting about our study, everybody, is that they felt that what Americans, the values that Americans will need, and probably everybody, human beings around the world, in dealing with what's going on right now, is much more of an emphasis on humanism and empathy. And what was fascinating, you guys, is that when we looked at the top, sorry, okay, I wish I could circle this for you. It's, it's not building, um, let me go back. So the top values that are needed in 2020, they rank ordered in this, in this order. The number one was kindness, honesty, optimism and acceptance in that order nine years ago and six months ago the number one value was compassion and it's so interesting to see that compassion people people's values and thoughts around compassion have changed now people believe and i think what has happened is that individuals and human beings have have undergone so much stress for many of the reasons i just described that they th they feel their personal compassion well has been a little tapped, but they believe that as a society, we need to exhibit that. And that comes in the form of kindness, optimism, and honesty. But it's really, really interesting to see people who identified so strongly with compassion have that change. So what personal goals are becoming more and less important in this time? There's always, what's been consistent is there's always been a focus in health and family across all these generations and just for your um just for you guys to have as a resource when i refer to gen z i'm talking about people 15 to 24. when i'm talking about millennials i'm talking about people 25 to 39. when i'm talking about gen x i'm talking about 40 to 55 year olds and when i'm talking about boomers it's 56 to 74. although there's a significant um, change in behavior of those boomers younger than 65 and those that are older than 65. 
And then finally, the silent, silent generation, which is 75 plus, and it's a weird, weird way to call someone, but you know, the silent generation. But anyway, so you have that as a backdrop. So you have the, everybody really believing that we need to be focused on health and family. That's gotten stronger and stronger. The older you are, you're, you're thinking about physical health, you know, taking my walk, staying strong, not getting sick. The younger you are, and especially in the middle age, Gen X and boomers, those of you that you know, may have people that have children, people that are working, people who have just lost their jobs, people who uh, have other people depending on them, their parents, for example, they are uh, demonstrating an untold level of, of mental stress. And they, and they cite that is, you know, one of the key changes, um, which is, you know, dealing with that has become much more important. So you've got this rising importance of mental health hitting. We've talked about that. Also, you're going to see the financial pressures are very, very different depending on the generation you're in. The younger you are or in the, or in the middle of this, making or saving a lot of money has become the number one thing. Especially if you're millennial or Gen X, you might be paying, paying off your college loans. You're trying to you know, you're trying to, you know, maybe pay off your car, you're saving for your, you know, down payment, hopefully for your home or, you know, just paying off credit cards. You want to get out of debt. That's a, another huge pressure. And then overlaid on this is like, am I in the right field? It's just like this whole thing with COVID has taught me about, is there a value of, you know, you better be doing what you really love doing because it's, it's in a way kind of fragile. And so this whole notion of learning a new skill or pursuing a new career is very front and center with people the younger they are and also landing that perfect job or that job that makes you feel great. The older you are, if you're closer, especially 65 and older, you've, you're, you're moving towards retirement, perhaps. You've made your choice in your job. You're, you know, you're relatively happy. You're spending time with your friends and your family. Your pressures are incredibly different from a, you know, from a, from a, a lot of other people. Um, so here we have, you know, people's, you know, we're talking about a real rising focus on financial security. And so you can see that there are significant debt differences by gender. Um, it's interesting. Um, women also prioritize staying healthy more than other generation, more than other than men do, for example. Um, Gen Z and millennials prioritize finding meaning more than other generations. Um, and in, other, in the other areas, there was literally not a, a significant change. Okay, let me. So if you're like a university or, you know, Terry and I were talking a little bit, if you're a college or a, or a university or a nonprofit and, and you rely on other people to give money to you or you, 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 know, you rely on your, your state to give you money, People are preoccupied with saving money right now or holding it for a rainy day or holding it for an emergency. And so just knowing that, just knowing that people are, are really preoccupied with saving that is a very important insight when you're asking people for money. Also understanding that people you work with, your students, you know, your friends, you know, just connecting with people on career and professional development is a really, really important way to kind of engage with people. Again, back to the original uh, relevance information, we're talking about an environment of, of it's noisy and it's fearful. So let's put, you know, the next thing on, which is the real, the real kicker, I think, that's happened in the last six months, and that is the inability for people right now to get reliably accurate information. And you know, I think, you know, I think this administration has, has really coined this notion of fake news in a way we've never, we've never really thought of it in that way before, but it's made all of us question the truth and sources, and there's much more skepticism than ever existed before. And you're seeing right now that people overall, of all respondents, um, worry about getting reliable information above staying connected with friends and family staying healthy and fit and they're finding that having civil discourses with others on controversial issues is becoming more difficult as well and we're going to go into that in a bit of detail and you're going to see some kind of sh kind of shocking statistics but let me shift for a minute to um to social media and um when you think about social media as a source of um of news um 
it's it's kind of cool. Um, so in this era of quote, as we are labeling it, fake news, even though we know that not all journalism by a long shot is fake, and some of it is very very re researched and very objective. And you also have to understand, you know, I remind myself as we're going through these research exercises, you look at the disappearing daily newspaper in the life of Americans, you know, where, you know, truly nonpartisan reporting on politics. That is all, of, that's all, you know, it's disappeared in many states. And you also have politically motivated news platforms like Breitbart and others that are, are replacing those news sources. So you have some real major shifts. But right now, well over half of Gen Zers get all or most of their news from social media. And those are the, those are the um, platforms you can see there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, you can read the list. Um, they're getting all or most of their news there. That's not the New York Times, you know, originally. It's, it's not maybe watching CNN, it's not watching 60 Minutes, maybe it's watching a little bit of John Oliver well over half if, if they're getting it they're getting it from a social media platform that's playing a link among those that get news from social media about a third are turning to facebook and one fifth of everyone turned to twitter or instagram so you look at the lack of trust right now in in facebook and what they've gone through uh, you know in their privacy issues and their data issues it's really interesting to think that one third of Gen Z are still getting their news from Facebook. So when it comes to social media, their trust, they still say they trust Facebook as a platform the most. Okay, next point. Sharing news on social media is, is absolutely just the, the most normal thing to do for Gen Zers, but their reasons for doing it are a little different from people that are older than they are especially the millennials and Gen Xers. They share the news that they strongly agree with or they like, but they do it for a sense of purpose as well. I mean, they say, this is something you really need to know about. They're, they're not sharing it to make a dig at someone else or to rub in their particular point of view politically. They're trying to raise awareness of thinking they, they think it's important. There's about one fifth they wanna know they want to voice their opinion, but they're also sharing with others their their interests. They are not as likely as other age groups get to challenge or to contribute to as much um, the lack of civil discourse that we're seeing. So, what's going to happen with social media? You know, you're seeing a lot of stuff going on with Facebook right now. Well, I don't think anybody actually predicts, you know, Gen Zers are going to give up on social media. But we asked them the God forbid question. We said, you know, if you were going to delete social media, what reason would you do it for? And you know, in the, you know, I think um, in the in the past, people have said, "Are you crazy? I don't can't even answer that question. I wouldn't even answer that question." Right now. People will say if they were to leave or delete their social media um, account, they would do it for the reasons of one, digital fatigue. They're worried about privacy and they're also probably pretty worried about their health. So even though two thirds are likely to keep their social media accounts next year, they would do them for the reasons I just mentioned. And I think the, the final reason is what everybody is feeling, which is just this distrust of media overall. And they would do it because they just don't want to be part of that anymore. So this is very new. This is very new. This is, these are very different drivers of behavioral change. And if you think about the role that Gen Zers have in buying brands, buying phones, they're and they have a, their target consumer for so many companies and brands this is a significant piece of information to us that they're even considering that and they're examining those platforms so you have to understand that every piece of communication you whoever is originating it is going to met, be met with a very healthy dose of mistrust but for relevance sometimes you know it's like the um you know the the darkest hour is just before dawn it's it's that the flip side to this is if you're authentic and you 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 are so careful about creating your content and you and there's depth to it you have the opportunity to be the trusted voice and the trusted source people can smell it sense it ferret it out immediately and they will and they will stick with you if you are if you are trusted 
um, and you're resonating. So that's, you know, just kind of like park that about, because we're going to come back to more on civil discourse, but I think that's a really important thing to remember. Um, additional stressors in this group are career and work, work life balance. Um, the younger you are, you know, you're, you, you're not as worried about finding the time to do the things you love. But I do think that is going to shift for Gen Z in the next six months because, you know, we, I know a lot of the students at Baruch are still on campus, but a lot of campuses, you know, even though they're still mostly virtual, a lot of kids, if they're not commuting to campus, are in their rooms and they don't have any of the same freedoms they had, you know, last year, for example, at college. So their entire social experience is in, intensely different. And I think we're going to we're gonna see a shift in that Gen Z number, finding time to do the things that they like to do in the next six months. But millennials are worried about advancing in, in careers and they're also worried about having enough time to do the things they like to do. But at the same time, they're worried about, you know, they're worrying about what are they supposed to be doing? So you got a big divide right now between people who are very early in career development and then those with established careers, and they really anticipate themselves staying in that career track for a while. So what do you do? Um, what do you do when you are trying to communicate that, or you're trying to reach someone who's on either side of that chasm? It's time to do as much listening as it does for talking, and that's why brands or, or organizations that just yell at you rather than listen um, are not gonna fare very well. Let me go back a little bit more to um, um, civil discourse. So right now, I think I, you know, I can't see see everybody on the screen. But if you raised your hands, um, I, I would you agree that right now, overall, it's the, you know the dialogue has become very, very, very divisive, um, and it's this it's this choice that we all make. It's like how do you maintain civil engagement and at the same time respect and honor the diversity of community? Not, not, not only just the ethnic diversity of community, the diversity of opinion. And what has been so, what has been fermenting over the last nine years, and you kind of almost look back to the Tea Party um, events that happened, you can see this kind of underpinning of lack of respect for others' opinions or or, or at least um, there's lip service being given to it. And so most people, the majority say, having civil conversations are becoming more and more difficult. And if you ask people why, um, bring that up, whoops, I'm sorry guys, my, my builds don't work anymore. Okay, so having civil um, discourse conversations are becoming more and more important in particular for millennials and Gen Xers. And it, why is this? Because this is the group that feels most, it's important to either share their opinion or correct an opinion that they don't agree with. And it's right square in that middle. So you're looking at people, um, you're looking at a group of people, probably 25 to 55, that are engaging in the highest level of negative and positive civil discourse online at the moment. So why? It's the internet. You know, people, the internet has like, the, it's almost like, you know, the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility. You feel like you're in there, you can just say anything you want and it doesn't matter. And, you know, no one will actually ever figure it out, it's you. And you, you just have this permission to kind of, you know, go at people. And so what we're, what we're I'm sorry. Um, so how do you find new ways to engage and manage discussions of equality and justice and inclusion. We've, we've got to do that. We've got to do that. And that's what this relevance um, survey is showing us. We're in this with a pendulum swimming, swinging from left to right. We're kind of in the middle of it. And we will find new ways, I believe. And, and I also, the, the encouragement to me comes from the younger generations, the Gen Zers in particular, as Terry said earlier, you all are our future. You know, you guys really are our future. And a lot of the things that you talk about being important for to you really show this, this abs absolute tendency and behavioral preference to, to be accepting and to think about diversity and inclusion. But in general, if you ask people if, in our survey, again, over the last six months, you ask people, how comfortable are you in discussing your personal views on, on the following without, with someone you don't know? So, People are, um, are, 
more comfortable just getting, getting right out there and talking about politics than they are about their views on environment and climate change or even religion. And that was really interesting and, and a bit surprising to me, although, you know, given the election season, that would make, make some sense. So ask, you ask people, you say, you know, what has been the impact to you personally on this, this loss of civil discourse? Half of Americans say that they have been labeled or typecast as a result of their personal and political views. And half of those people say it's resulted in some form of discrimination. It's like, oh, you support Black Lives Matter or, oh, you're a Trumper. Um, it's people are putting people in boxes. And these numbers are really high among millennials and Gen Xers. Two thirds of that group say that they've been labeled or typecast for their views. And um, this is costing them relationships. Two in five people say that they've lost or severed a relationship due to an online dispute. And that can be with a family member, for example. So you're losing, people are losing those, fra tr those think about the community, um, um, the community relevance uh, quadrant that I showed you. Look at the, the impact civil discourse has on one of the most important drivers in our society right now, which is the community, which is tribes, which is, and, and how important language in particular can either divide or unite. So again, this is just kind of talking about, the, you know, how language and, and how to label, how labeling people is so dangerous. And also, you know, how do, you, how do we move from this moment in time to one we're able to engage in conversation in a respectful and inclusion, inclusive manner. Well, there's some clues actually in what people term corporate social responsibility. And, you know, even though we can't talk about politics perhaps very well, um, we can talk about behaviors we want to see in the client, you know, in corporations or the corporations who make products that we buy. So for example, you think um, we ask people if, Think about one, one product or surface, um, service you feel most loyal to. What is it? And, and then why? And people, it's kind of fun that people really think about food and drink is, is still, it, you know, is still number one. And this is very consistent with about nine years ago. Um, and falling to the bottom are, is media and information um, sources. Those are more the platforms. When I talk about uh, news and information sources, I'm thinking about things like New York Times, um, you know, t uh, television stations. I'm talking about social media platforms when I'm talking about information um, services. Also, the pandemic has just really, uh, I think, exacerbated the amount of stuff we're buying at home. So we're ordering in food. It's our entertainment not right now. We're doing a little shopping, at least for the, you know, clothes, that you, the tops you can wear for Zoom calls and things like that. So it makes a lot of sense. But top reason for product loyalty one, it helps meet my needs, okay, food, but it makes me feel good to support it, like a local business. It makes my life easier. I feel, um, you know, I, I'm on Zoom calls 10, 10 hours a day, and it, I associate it with the values that are important to me. And when you saw all of that backlash happen with Goya products, for example, I think that's a really interesting example of the number four. I associate it with values that are very, very important to me. Um, so again, you'll see over the last, the change from 2014 to 2020, um, people um, are less loyal to electronics and media and news, and they're, they're, they're um, more loyal to things like auto, food and drink and clothing. Very, um, it, that was not true before. So why, what, where's the loyalty thing coming? Where's the, where's the essence of relevance in this notion of loyalty? And especially around CSR. And you know, CSR meaning um, corporate social responsibility. Issues of sustainability, you know, how long a product can exist without causing denigration to society, to supply chains, to the environment is the number one most influential in terms of people's purchase decisions, particularly uh, among Gen Z, for sure. Um, less so among boomers and silent generation, but that is increasing in that group. 
and especially around things you purchase as a consumer, whether it's a home, a car, a razor, a shirt, those things, we're looking at each one of those purchases as something, um, you know, I, you know, it's like the resurgence of savers, you know, it's like the fact about reusing clothing has become a really important thing rather than just um, buying something brand new. When you look at other issues that are the second most important are labor and human rights, and those are particularly important to women and those over 55. So on the right hand side, rather than focusing on the numbers, you can just see and you'll see when Terry sends this deck to you that, you know, environment, labor, workforce, diversity and cause related funding are four out four areas that people think about when they're making a purchase decision. And then then we ask people, you know, we, they think about those first and then we ask them to rate particular categories. And those were things like expensive purchases, something that was more general and something that was just personal. So we asked them how they felt in general and then we got very, very specific around products. This continues, by the way, into those of you as you're interviewing for jobs or thinking about a company, um, we ask people what is the um, most important if you're considering a job offer or if you're thinking about investing in a company yourself. And, for people that are thinking about a new job, most Americans say that labor and human rights and diversity, equity, and inclusion are by far the most important in terms of their, their decision to go join a company. Um, however, if you are lucky enough to have money to invest, um, there are, there, um, those are, those are um, slightly different, and I'm going to show you a little bit more on the second slide. One thing worth noting, women are much more likely to think about a company's labor and human rights policies when they're making their decisions. And millennials as a whole really care about sustainability. Whoops. So if you're thinking about, a, um, a, you know, a, um, so if you're thinking about a purchase decision, I, I won't go through all of these, but you can look in at them in the deck. This is about the most expensive goods. These are the decisions about, you know, moderately pr priced, and these are the personal items like a razor blade or something like that. Again, across the board, uh, sustainability and, and labor, the most important. So this is an, switching now to um, entirely new, um, um, this is switching now to entirely this new, very recent research, and we ask people for brands to connect with Gen Zers, how do they? Um, how are they going to need to do it? Um, and really, it's all about making sure you're able to articulate the values of the company. And that's what I was talking about earlier. How important it is to have your content re reflect your values, your authenticity, the, the deep dive, your knowledge of the, whatever it is that you're selling or offering your knowledge, and articulating your focus on social justice and the reasons that people stay loyal to you. And, and a lot of that, I mean, most of our recent work, it's really interesting whether you're, if you go into the pharmaceuticals or you go into financial services, whatever your path is, there are your shareholders are gonna be looking at your company's commitment to sustainability. You know, they're gonna look at their environmental footprint. They're gonna look at their hiring practices, what their board compositions are like. So, you know, this this whole notion about a commitment to sustainability is really important for Gen Z and even more significant, just like what I was talking about leaving a social platform, over three fourths of Gen Zers have switched from one product to another because they learned something about the company for any reason. Most notably, it was a recommendation of a friend that said, you got to check this out or you got to be part of that. Or they just noticed, again, on probably a social media platform that this particular company or product was doing a lot of good. The opposite of that, of course, is if a Gen Zer notices negative behavior, they'll, they'll, they'll switch very, very quickly. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about charitable giving right now. I'm just going to tell you that charitable giving really, really has to line up with values in a huge way. And it's people are a lot less worried about where their exact scent goes to the values of the organization that they're giving it to and the community they want to be part of that with. And so it's this is again the, the information that I told you about earlier, how compassionate was once the most important most important driver and how it has significantly changed. 
um, people, um, you know, think of themselves as more focused now. I, their happiness has gone down and their optimism has gone down. And that's really, really interesting. Um, in eight years, the, the, the majority of that decline in those areas has happened over the last six months. But again, I don't think it, this is, I, it's, it is, it's, it's worrisome, but it doesn't mean that people, that doesn't mean that empathy and all of those things aren't going to come back. Um, but people are, people are being very pragmatic right now. They, they're worried about having money to take care of themselves. They're worried about being able, you know, it's, it's, it's like Maslow hierarchy, hierarchy of need right now. We need to take care of the essentials. And then we'll get back to caring and taking care for as many, as many people we have in our own capacity of humans to support. But it's very, very interesting. This plays out in charitable giving. And you'll see um, that the number one place that people are giving money right now are to their communities. They're giving back to their communities, to food banks, to local organizations, to hopefully to colleges that are in their communities, and obviously to health. And it's been really hard for other health condi conditions to compete for dollars and time during this COVID era because people aren't just, people aren't thinking about them. You know, they're not thinking about cancer in the same way they thought about while they're, while COVID is going on. It's, COVID's just taken priority because it's just more, it's more urgent right now. Education is number four, um, but it's still on the top four list. If you do want to be on the top three list if you can. And you kind of, I, you can just see here the, um, the, the acceleration or the decline. Again, these are the original relevance values I shared with you at the beginning. So I explained how the thinking values, community, and sensory work. These are the shifts we've seen over the nine year period with, with definitely seeing growth in sensory community and values and less so on the thinking side. Thinking is, <laughs> the data is becoming a little bit less important. And so one of the things that important to understand about communities and tribes, so you think about people, I mentioned this whole notion, the stress that is being put on communities through civil discourse. You take a look at um, communities and tribes, and in particular with millennials. So again, I'm just gonna make sure you understand millennials are, we're thinking about people 25 to 39. For them, it's the whole, what's, what holds millennials together is just they're, they're linked by their common experiences. So whether they're going to church or synagogue or, um, they're, or they're eating out, and those of us that are eating out a little bit maybe, you know, um, but that's kind of tough to do right now that are volunteering, uh, sports clubs, all of those things have now become virtual activities. And it's, um, they're, you know, it's, it's very tough to kind of have the same kind of sensory um, experience so but still these tribes are existing but if you think about these tribes that are becoming more and more virtual and they're more and more glued by social media and social platforms the the the, the rate the, you know the rate of not only non-accurate information but also just discord it's really impacting communities and tribes and so um People, people gather around their preferences and people use, and there's tribes that have very specific language that unites them. Language is beautiful when it brings us together. Language can be very, very divisive. And when it divides us, it just, it makes tribes insular and dangerous. Um, one of the coolest things about people talk about at any age is their, their number one desire is friendship. It's, that's why they're part of something, is for friendship. Um, the younger you are and the older you are, it's about having fun. Ironically, in the middle makes sense. You're a little bit more worried about you know learning and, and the younger you are. But friendships are tribes and friendship and groups of friendships are tribes and their communities and their families. And you can see how this has been stressed so much, but I don't think it's it's definitely not um, broken forever. Um, and it's you know it's, and some some tribes are doing just fine. But you can see how you know, your parents and siblings, your spouse and children, um, those relationships are the most important to them. But the younger you are, the more you care about your friends. And then one last kind of topic to kind of look at as we kind of end our conversation together looking at relevance is school. 
So many of you who are, you know, maybe some of you on the call today are freshmen, maybe you are seniors, maybe you're somewhere, you know, what the data tells us right now at this moment in time is you chose your school because of the ac academic experience. And then you maybe cared about things like the cost and, you know, track record on jobs, things like that, who you're going to meet, campus experience. What never existed before the last six months, but is really important now, is the location of the school. Because of COVID, the location of the school is critically important. And that is something we're seeing right now that we've never seen before. Um, so if you think about, you know, you're thinking about a college, a university, or an other formal learning experience, you're really ranking how well they can help prepare you for a career, but also, you know, they're also uh, also about how close you are. So in, 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 in just wrapping up, what I would tell everybody is the world has changed a lot since we started this first relevance methodology and even more so in the last eight more months. And right now, I think given what we're going to be going into, into the election and in the sort of interregnum period between um, the next inauguration, it's really important, more important than ever, that brands, institutions, and leaders are in tune with Americans' priorities and rights and how they're shifting. And to be just a conveyor of great and accurate and meaningful information. And I think we're in a need to really look at these trends and we're seeing how some of the behavioral sh shifts are changing, which ones are gonna stay and which ones are going to evolve. But um, it's, you know, the, the last six months have been um, incredibly, it have, uh, have been an incredible, uh, an incredible time. But I say, you know, stay strong and carry on. And there's a lot of, a lot of good insight in this data as well. Thank you all so much for your time today. I know that was a lot, and I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Back to you, Terry. Well, thank you. And um, again, if you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, share them via the chat. But I'm going to use the. Uh, oh, what is the check? My name is Megan. Thank you so much. Enlightening presentation over the last. See what's happening here. Over the last couple of months, we've seen many companies shutting off their phone. Uh, we've seen many companies cooperate, uh, broaching important but touchy issues. There have this has at times been perceived as inauthentic by many, even when the intentions are genuine. How do brands convey authenticity and good intentions to jaded millennials and Gen Zs? That is a good question. Mm. Terry, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm so sorry if you were reading that to me. Could you, could you speak up I, a little bit? Sorry. Ruthie, can you hear me? Uh, Andy, I think if you click on the chat, you should be able to see the questions come up on the bottom of the screen. There we go, that's better. I'm, uh, I'm not getting, okay, hang on. I can read the question. Okay, I saw, I see it. Oh. Yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, convey authenticity and good intentions? I think, it is really important to be honest. It's 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 really important to be honest about the th even your mistakes. People are much more willing to engage with a brand that says, "I'm not perfect. I haven't figured it all out. Have our hiring practices been perfect? No. Are we going to change them? Yes. Um, is our environmental footprint um, perfect? No. Here are the specific actions we're taking on changing them." Um, you know, um, we have we have a, uh, a management team inside our company that are all white males um, that have never ever encountered some of the discrimination that people inside um, their companies or that use their products have. How is this group of people going to educate themselves and change and become more in tuned to 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 protect 
future generations from systemic racism, for example. It's, it, is, it's the, it is the steps and the honesty that people are willing to take and just be really authentic about your journey. If you, you know, we're calling it greenwashing, for example, if you greenwash things, people smell through it right away. They just, they say, forget it. I'm not, I'm not coming back. But I, I don't think you can be afraid to A, admit your mistakes and, and also to communicate. People sometimes don't want to communicate when they're doing, they're afraid to communicate during a time when they're uncertain or they don't quite, quite know what to do or they think they're going to be judged in a negative way. And it's communicating authentically and humbly. It's very, very important. I hope that answers some of your questions. What, what do you advise your, can you hear me? What do you advise your clients uh, in the current environment? Things uh, seem to change so fast that it's hard to uh, put a stake in the ground and, and defend it because the ground is shifting. And what do you, what do, you do in that environment? Um, I tell people to stay, I mean, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but that's very difficult if you don't know why you're relevant to your clients in the first place. And I always go back to a brand like Patagonia, who has been absolutely consistent about their, um, the, how they make their products, their dedication to sustainability, to the, to the environment. They've been very, very consistent. Now, a lot of this stuff might dis disrupt their supply chain. I don't know exactly what their hiring practices are like. You don't know if someone's, you know, a lawsuit is gonna come up or one of their, there's gonna be an issue at one of their manufacturing plants. You don't know, but you, you do know that Patagonia has had very consistent messaging and very authentic messaging for a long time. Um, and they can, you can draw on that. Um, it's difficult for people that have, really really screwed up and have been on completely on inauthentic to become authentic and that is and that is it really it that's very very tough um i do find that monitoring social media conversation is really important for clients um it's you'll be surprised about how many clients actually don't talk to people directly, like get real one-on-one -on -one personal information from their client base. A lot of it's done by surveys. A lot of it's done very informally. They don't, you know, they get a, a voicemail and an automated kind of, you know, situation. I mean, really getting qualitative insight into how your customers are feeling is probably one of the best ways to navigate, you know, navigate change very, very quickly. Um, and also, I'm telling people right now, Terry, to do a lot of scenario planning. What do you do under this scenario if this person wins? What happens in this series of events? What are you going to do if this person um, wins and this series of events stay in place? What are you going to do if X, Y, Z, if you know, if you know, if communities, for example, are under siege for any examples during you know any t amount of time during the voting? Um, during voting, um, I'm a lot of this is planning what if scenarios and what are all the potential ways um, their businesses could be disrupted. And but the bottom line is just communicating to employees and making people are much more comfortable and confident, and your customers are much more confident, and and your boards of directors are if they think you've thought through things and you care about them and you're doing the best of your ability to make it right for your clients and your employees and the communities you serve. And that's all you can do. There's not, you can't predict everything, but you can do your best. Well, our time is, is up, uh, unfortunately. Uh, Andy, uh, excellent job in summarizing an incredible amount of information. I will, uh, I will post the deck on our website so that any, anyone who wants it, I guess we could email, well, why would we email it? If someone wants it, they'll, they'll find it on our, our website. As I said, I intend to just take this, and ship it to Chengdu, and there'll be 240 students that will look at this Thank and you. probably have additional questions and, and comments, which if I get them back, I will be happy to share with you. But uh, oh, I love the bottom, that. 
the bottom line is uh, for the first virtual, this was an excellent, excellent event. So thank you very much and thank everyone else who came and stayed and uh, get very few dropouts. That's excellent. And I'm pleased. So not that that matters, but I'm pleased nevertheless. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry, Ruthie, and Cleve. Bye. Bye-bye. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.